So we don't have a ton of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into things. And I hope to be able to, um, you have to forgive everyone wants to take my picture really <laughs> quickly. So let's get that out of the way. Right. Um, <laughs> we don't have a ton of time. I'm going to jump right into things. We'll have a few minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So please be thinking about that as we <coughs> chat. Um, I'm fascinated by the notion uh, that, that someone invented techno. I spent, you know, I've spent 20 years of my life, 25 years of my life, listening to various forms of electronic music. Right. Um, when I was younger, it never occurred to me that someone invented it, <laughs> right? It was just something that was always there. So how aware were you uh, in your early days of experimenting that you were, in fact, inventing a style of music? Um, you know, I knew that I was doing something different, um, you know, that wasn't the, the norm, it wasn't conventional way of, of making music. Um, uh, I didn't know uh, how successful it was, was going to be or, you know, that I would be traveling around the world later, but uh, I, I was just doing what felt good in, in my gut, you know. And uh, this was at a time when, when synthesizers had just become uh, cheap enough for a regular guy like me to, to purchase one and have it at home, you know. You, you came from a little bit of a musical family. Like your dad was in, in the music business, is that right? Yeah, my dad was a constant promoter. Uh, he, he brought in uh, like Barry White and uh, uh, Michael Henderson Into to, Detroit. to Detroit. Yeah. And, That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was able to watch, watch the, the backdrop behind that, you know. And, um, and my grandmother was she played organ, although she wasn't like a professional or nothing like that. She just she didn't invent any genres. No, no, no. But she just surprised me one day. She got on there and started, started banging it up. Yeah, man. I was like, wow. And, and in your early days, you learned instruments, but not necessarily synthesizers. You were learning like piano. I, I, or? I, I actually uh, was playing uh, bass guitar. Bass guitar. Yeah. And and then drum. Well, I talked my dad into buying uh, one Christmas. Uh, for my brother to get some drums for Christmas, which was really for me, but <laughs> That's I talked a good to him to get them for him because I wanted uh, something else, and, uh, <laughs> and so I said, "Well, why don't he get some drums?" So yeah, he would really like some drums. Yeah. <laughs> Did he actually want drums? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> he, I don't think he ever even touched them. Yeah. By design. Yeah. Well, so. Uh, tell me about those those early days of starting to experiment. Wh when was the first time that um, you heard a synthesizer or heard that kind of a sound and realized it was something that you wanted well, to mess with? Uh, my, I, I grew up with my grandma and um, well, when I was little, like elementary school, and uh, she had this Hammond B3 organ. And, uh, and, you know, I would play around and just, I mean, I wasn't really making music, but you know, I would just like to like just bang on it, you yeah. know? And uh, so when she, she goes to the shop to, to get uh, like sheet music or get something like service for, the, for this organ, they had a room in the back. It was a store called Grinnell's. And they had a room in the back that was uh, where they was bringing in these new synthesizers like Cork, uh, the Cork MS-10, uh, Minimo. These were like the first small mon monophonic synthesizers that were available, you know to, you know, that had come down in price and were available, you know. I think that they were, you know, just like made. And uh, so I was able to talk her into getting me one. I think we went to Grinnell's one Christmas or it was my birthday or something and I was able to talk my grandma into buying me this Cork MS-10. This would have been in, in like the late 70s, this early 80s? This was like 79. 79. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, so, I mean, I went, I went home and I took this machine and, and, and the thing about a synthesizer is that you can create just about any sound that you can think of. And uh, so I actually created my own drum kits and uh, drum, you can make like drum sounds, kicks, snares, hi-hats, and you know, all this is just noise, white noise, depending on how you filter it. And, and you're, uh, you're a kid at this time. How old are you? Uh, like I'm like 17, 16. Oh, okay. 17. So yeah, just about, to, just about to graduate. And uh, so uh, I created these demos uh, just on this one chord. Well, I actually still had my bass guitar, so I threw some of that in there. And, um, and uh, so my first year in college, 
uh, I met Rick Davis, who was ex-Vietnam vet, and, uh, and he was like already progressed in the world of synthesis. You know, he had a, a ARP Odyssey and, and, a, and he had like a couple of mono, mono, I mean polyphonic keyboards. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he, he didn't, he was really kind of standoffish at first, you know, until I brought one of these demos into class. And, uh, and everybody in the class, because I was in like a music class, he was in there, and everybody in the class wanted to wanted to bang with me now, now because they because this this music and so he invited me over to uh, to you know to jam with him and uh, I went to his went to his house man it was like in his room it was like walking into a spaceship or some a cockpit of a spaceship or something a lot of gear yeah yeah and he had the, the lights down the windows shaded and it was so so all you could see was the LEDs and from these keyboards and it was like it was like a sort of a touching moment for me and uh so he you know he he's the one that kind of like uh introduced me to a lot more like the sequence of cork msq sequencer i mean the uh, roland sequencer and things like this but he had already made a record but it was just a sort of an atmosphere record it wasn't didn't have any beats in it it was just like uh Soundscape. You, the name of this record was called Methane C, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, that's basically what it sounded like. And uh, so uh, we we jammed and we we made a couple of tracks. Uh, I think Alleys of Your Mind and Cosmic Rain Dance was like the first tracks we did together, and we eventually uh, released them on on our own label. We named it called the label Deep Space Records, and uh, this was around '81, and. Uh, and uh, there was a DJ on the radio called Electrifying Mojo in Detroit. And basically, this was when FM radio had just started. Yeah, people could still experiment with it. Yeah, I mean, it was only three stations on the dial at this time. It was, like, still fresh, you know. And, and it was no real format because, you know, it was a new, it was, it was in its infancy stage. Yeah. So, you know. For, the, for those of you that aren't from America or don't, can't fully appreciate this, in America, radio has become so rigidly formatted yeah. that, you know, you can only play this specific type of adult exactly. contemporary music on this station. And, you know, but in the early days of FM radio, it was just, it, it was some of the, the, the greatest radio ever. You yeah. had the people that knew the most about music and were the most passionate about music playing whatever they wanted to play. Yeah, yeah. So he, he had no format restriction. And, uh, I mean, he would play the whole spectrum. Yeah. I mean, you know, he would play a James Brown record back to back with a with a Peter Frampton record. Yep. Uh, he would play America and then turn around and play uh, the Jimi Hendrix and you know and, and all kind of stuff, man. And uh, he played like first P funk records. And yeah. Was P funk very influential to you? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating when we look at music history around the same time. You've got you and uh, you know Derek May and Kevin uh -huh. Saunderson and these guys emerging from Detroit. And I know you you work with them. You yeah, recorded yeah. with them. You, well, you well, I basically taught them. Yeah, yeah. Everything they. That's know, what basically. I meant to say. You taught them. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know you've you've got you emerging from Detroit and at around the same time you uh -huh. have uh, Africa Mbata right. coming out of the Bronx. Right. And you have very similar influences and yet you you kind of it's this last great moment where uh, the roots of techno and the roots of hip hop are basically in the same place, largely, I, mean, I guess, influenced by Parliament. Yeah, Bellic. I mean, it, it was at a time when this, this, like I said, this technology was was becoming, you know, available to the to the normal to the average person, yeah. I should say. And uh, so these, you know, uh, in different cities, it, you know, it was kind of starting to kind of come out. Like uh, in New York, it happened to be Africa Mabata Soul Sonic Force. And uh, which was after my record, but I was in Detroit, so yeah. it was like Detroit is, wasn't known to uh, be a big market music uh, city. Well, in these know. days, if you put out a great record in yeah. Detroit, you'd be releasing it to the world, and everyone would know. Well, about yeah, it. now, you know, yeah, yeah, you would have had a five-minute career that was fueled <laughs> by internet hype, and then it would have been over. But you know, I think, right. um, I, I think, I think at that time, it's tough to appreciate how. Um, how sort of secluded Detroit would have been. And you tell this great story, you got to New York to promote your record, and that was the first time you heard Bombada's Planet Rock. Yeah, they, and, and they you weren't was necessarily debuting. so excited about that. <laughs> I mean, it was a, I mean, it was a great record, yeah, yeah. you know. It, and on one hand, I was like, yeah, this is like, it sounded like my music. And, 
and I was like, well, hey, it's a good day for, for this type of music, yeah. but I'm not the one that they're playing. So, you know, it was kind of a sweet and sour kind of thing. But uh, yeah, so I went to New York to promote my uh, my next my second single, Cosmic Cars, and it was funny. It was as soon as I, as soon as we got there, it was like it was one station had and it had this record, and they were like teased. They was on the air actually teasing the other record stations, like yeah, we got this first, nah, 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 and uh, and uh, and man, it, it just it blew up. Which you're talking you know, about, Planet, Planet, Planet Rock, Rock. Yeah. Planet Rock, and I mean it was it was good because it kind of broke down a door for us. I mean, on, on one hand, uh, you know, but, you know, at that point I was wishing like, I should have been living in New York. But, you know, it was reasons for me to be in Detroit and coming out of Detroit with that. One last so. question for you about these very early days, which is, um, you know, people talk a lot about these subgenres and the names of different styles of music, and we'll yeah. talk about like EDM in a moment and right. what, what this all means, but, mm -hmm. um, like, like, what for you personally, where do you see, and when you look at history, where do you see the dividing line uh, between sort of some of the music that came before you, maybe like a craft work or, you know, some of the synthesizers that uh, George Clinton was using? Yeah. Where do you see the dividing line between that and then techno? What, what, what is the difference? What, what makes that a different style of music? And uh, The difference is, uh, I think, is more marketing now. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and, and a lot of people that are making electronic music now. You're talking about EDM now today? Yeah. Okay. Well, just electronic in yeah. general. Um, our young kids that don't really know too much about, you know, the business and what, you know, and, 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 and I think that the, the, the major industry is kind of trying to exploit the, the naivety of these, these producers. And uh, uh, I think that that's uh, probably one of the, the biggest differences now. How do you feel about, um, just since we, since we sort of went here, how do you feel about EDM? How do you feel about the fact that uh, there's folks that are making music that isn't so different in style from some of the, the hits that you've had over uh -huh. the years in a more underground way, and are, you know, they're on pop radio, they're making millions of dollars, they're, you know, they're trendy, you know, it's like an Avicii or a David Guetta, you turn on the radio and their songs are everywhere. Yeah. Is that something, when you see that, is it something that you as, as really the, the guy that created a lot of this style of music originally, do you take a certain pride of authorship in that, or, or is it more like you know one of these days I ought to, you know, get more credit or or you know, that kind of thing, or how do you how do you take it? Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it's not. I'd be pissed off. Let me just say, like, you know, I. I mean, not, you know what? I mean, you know, but be, getting pissed off is not. It's not going bring nothing else to the table. Unless you turn it into you know a great track. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, you know, but, um, you know, no, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not upset about it. It's like, because I do, uh, I do a different, a whole different thing. You know, I think that um, uh, not only a, with the fact that, that I kind of created this style, you know, musically, uh, was my music was a little bit as innovative as well. I mean, if I was just using an acoustic instrument, it would have probably still been, you know, had that had the feeling that it had. It wasn't just about the technology. Yeah. It was also the song and and the, the song behind it as well. And uh, so uh, you know, I like where I am. You know, and and uh, you know. Uh, more power to them guys, you know. Um, you know, it's, it, it's you know, and it, it's nice that if you know somebody wanna you know makes a reference to Detroit or to myself, that's cool, you know. But uh, people aren't educated enough. I mean, I have to say, as a guy that you know, as a journalist, I started writing about this scene. Yeah. If you go and talk to all the people that Avicii listened to growing up, and I don't mean to pick on Avicii, he's a uh -huh. perfectly nice guy. Right. But if you if you go and talk to all the people that Avicii listened to growing up. And then you, you talk to those DJs, they all grew up listening to you. Uh -huh. But I don't know that Avicii fully knows this, or right. that today's crop of DJs knows their, 
knows their history right. in the right way. And it's weird because you know, if you t in in other styles of music, like in rock and roll, everyone knows the the canon. Everyone knows the roots. Everyone knows. So it's it just it feels like a, a a story that needs to be told more. I mean, I think you should be in like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to the extent that that institution <laughs> well, matters at all. Yeah. But you know, that's how influential I think you've been to to modern music. Well, who knows? Maybe it might still could happen. I'm going to send an email to someone right yeah. after this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a little bit, I mean, I, there's a lot of folks in the audience here that uh, work in the, in the music business, and um, you know, you as a, as a label president, as the head of a label for a very long time, how, has, um, how have you been embracing all the changes in the music business? How has technology changed the way you think about the business of running a record label in the last five or ten years? Um, you know, you just, it, you know, things are happening with, with the technology is moving so fast that you just got to, you got to stay ahead of the curve in a way. I mean, you just, you got to keep constantly being on your toes. And, and you know, I'm not, I, I'm not looking at it like, uh, you know, wow, you know, it's changed so much, I can't, you know, uh, I can't keep up. Keep up. I, I look at it as more opportunities. And uh, just to be creative like I was in 1981, it just is more available now to, to be more creative. Innovate and in the business the same way you innovate. Exactly, in the exactly. And it's, it's just, you know, I mean, I, I constantly now think of all of the different ways that I can attack the market mm -hmm. as opposed to what was available then, you know. What's something recently that's really worked for you, would you say? Or what's like one of these approaches that has kind of been? Well, I mean, definitely, I mean, you know, the internet has changed the world, yep. you know, and, 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 and so now it's like, you know, you can you can you can market your, yourself, or you can market your label, uh, and you don't have to pay some some guy, some uh, marketing or promotion guy to, to promote your your music or your records. You know, it's it's a it's a way that you you know, I've always believed in having direct access to your market, or to your followers or your fans, and and now uh, it's really easy to do that. You do you know. enjoy social media yourself? You're on Twitter, I think. I know that as at Juan Atkins. Do you, do you like interacting uh, with fans? You, you, you know, um, it, it's it's a good it's good it's a good tool. Um, I have problems with putting all of my laundry out there, mm. uh, so uh, I don't I don't really um, tweet a lot or whatever. You know, because it's like, you know, I'm not into like, hey, you know, I'm on my way to the toilet, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know. So you've been reading like my that. Twitter feed. Then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, from that respect, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it could, it could work. It's, it works in ways that it needs to work, you know. Right on. Yeah. Um, w when we look at, uh, has, has the EDM explosion been good for some of the folks that have been doing this for a long time, like uh, you know, all of a sudden interest does it create new fans for you that find you sort of indirectly because they, you know, they used to listen to pop music and then they went from there into like the Avicis and the David Guettas and then that takes them down a path towards, uh, you know, more uh, maybe legit uh, techno and house music. Do you see that showing up in crowds? I don't. I, you, no, I mean, it's, it's you know, the crowds have been the same for me. Uh, I've always, you know. Uh, most play, I, I don't play to too many empty rooms, and uh, and it's 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 been about the same. I can't really say that it's went one well, went one way or another. Um, you know, uh, so, so hasn't uh, really had hasn't had much of an effect. Uh, I, I I don't know. I don't really okay. know. I mean, you know, I, I I don't think so. I think it's I think you know my numbers are are you know. Uh, pretty much the same as they always been. How do you, you discover know? new music now? I mean, as a DJ, you're always looking for, um, for you know, sort of next great new tracks and things to add to your set, I would imagine? Well, yeah, I mean, because, uh, you know, I have to, I have to, uh, have to definitely do the research and, and you know, listen to a, a, a gang of tracks. Yeah. Uh, so do you just have, like, so many people kind of sending you stuff? I get people that, sending stuff. I get promos. Um, uh, but even when, even before, like digital uh, downloads and things came along, I've always believed in actually buying my music. Because when you go out there and you pick and you spend your hard-earned money on a on a record, you know it's going to be good. 
you know, and you know, when somebody sends you something, I mean, it's what they want, they want to send you. It's yeah. not what you would necessarily go pick. Uh, so, you know, I still uh, actually buy a lot of music and the promo, I mean, I listen. But, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of times, I don't really have time to go through all those promos. So, yep, yep, you know. Yep. Um, okay. Um, is there anything out there today, or are there any artists out there today that, um, whether they're affiliated with you or not affiliated with you, that you think are, um, you know, especially strong? And I'd apply that across. I mean, we talked about EDM a little bit. Like, what, you know, do you listen to any of that stuff? Is it, is it? Not really, no, <laughs> no. Uh, um, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I couldn't really put my finger on, on any. I mean, it, <laughs> that's that's to me in a way. I mean, uh, the technology is great, and and it, and it it provides a way for uh, uh, people that probably wouldn't normally make music to make music now and do music. Um, but um, um, I don't really see. It's it's the downside is is that. Uh, it's so much music coming out. It's like it's hard to to concentrate on one artist or or no, you know, like yeah. you know. I mean, when I first few uh, some years ago, uh, when I was buying records, you know, I, I mean, it was a certain artist that I would wait. They would release an album every year, and I would actually literally go to the store at the time when I thought they were going to be released releasing the record, you know, to ask, hey, did the new T Funk record, did the new uh, Parliament Funkadelic record come? And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, eventually showed up. That doesn't happen no more, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, and it's, 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 there's no uh, really concentration on, on artists except for those big, big names that you mentioned. But uh, to me, that's all marketing. It's no, it's, it's, it's no real substance there. You know, uh, you know. One last thing before we get to. Are there some questions in the audience? I would certainly hope so. Yeah, great. So one last thing before we get to questions, just to give people a chance to know. Uh, you know, a couple months ago, you had a a pretty significant bump in the road in terms of your health, mm -hmm. and we're all certainly glad that it seems like you're on the better side of that now. Right. But you actually had a uh, a kidney transplant. This is one of your first trips since that. Yeah. So that's all. You trip. have a clean bill of health now. Yeah. Knock on yeah. wood. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't felt this, this good in, in, in like in about five, ten years. And uh, so, uh, yeah, my little sister donated her kidney for me. And uh, your, your brother probably didn't do it because you made him get that drum set. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, my brother, uh, you know, he has some health issues that wouldn't yeah, allow him to do it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, yeah, so I, I'm uh, you know I'm I'm feeling great now. Back I mean, in trucking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, one last question that I have: Were those early days of innovating? Those early days when you were a kid and being out in the club scene? I mean, it's a notorious party scene, and I I'm not above it myself. I had I don't remember a lot of things because I had way too much fun in the '90s. But did was that scene back then when you were innovating and you were thinking about it? Was it like was it a creativity that was fueled by partying, or was it more just kind of a, an academic and serious sort of uh, drive to create music? Well, I mean, it was uh, it or was a little bit of both. Yeah, it was a, it was dance music. It was definitely uh, in in the back of my mind that you know, hey, you know, I want some DJs to play this at certain parties, yeah, you know, yeah. and so, you know, hence you would make it with a long intro with just drums, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the tracks started out with just drums, so it made it easy for a DJ to mix it in. Working at the right time. You know, but uh, yeah, so it's definitely kind of an influence. It was an influence there. You know? Were you and your friends that were making music, were you guys partiers? Were you guys kind of part of that scene? Was it, was it a party scene or was it really just like kind of more of a nerdy music maker scene? Um, I'm talking about like you know. well, we were we were all D, we were all DJs at the same time. Yeah. So uh, you know it it was definitely intertwined. Gotcha. Uh, uh, but we were all serious about the music. Right. You know right. it was it was like you know it was serious, and uh, you know so you know uh, it wasn't like we were when we were making these tracks we were partying at the same time. You know it was. Uh, you know, but but it was definitely uh, a lot of it was geared towards the dance floor, gotcha. and uh, and you know, 
I, I guess before you before we end it, you know, I just wanted to say that uh, see now, you know, where music is now, you know, you got the kids aren't going out buying electric guitar and drums no more. You know, they're buying Ableton Nine and and uh, native instruments and you know these these machines, man. And and I think that what the industry and what people should should realize is that this this gear is is, is making uh, artists and making these young kids more creative than than it's ever been in history. And so people should open open their mind a little bit more and and, and like not let the, the industry force feed what they think because you know when the industry when they when the big big companies get behind something you know it's not about what the people want it's about what they want the people to want you know and you know what's should, fascinating though over yeah. the last couple of days as i've been listening to the different conversations as uh -huh. you folks have been even just watching like sort of who fills the room here and who doesn't right. you know it used to be the the ceos the fat cats the guys that were running the big institutional things yeah that's what everyone showed up to see you had uh, to hear what they had to say yeah these days, it's like the guys that are inventing the apps fill the rooms, right. and the people that that sort of are, you know, we there was a presentation here on the stage about uh, contest winners for yeah. you know new technologies and new platforms, and that's what filled the room more than Doug Morris filled the room, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's. Uh, you know, to your point, yeah. it, it's it's such a credit. Like people, I think those folks, frankly, they had their moment and they they've they've made enough mistakes and there's enough other options now. Right. That yeah. it's just it's the revolution is happening. Yeah. You just yeah. lived it, you know, a couple decades when it was still hard to do. Yeah. And it's still hard now, but that's why you know people are here and they're trying to share ideas and learn learn from folks like yeah. you. Yeah. But I mean, it's like this, the technology technology is not going to stop. I mean, this stuff is coming fast and furious. Yeah. And, and just, you know, people should just, you know, just, you know, you have options. And, you know, you should really <laughs> let yourself go and explore those options. Brilliant. You know? Let's take a couple of questions. We'll go just a little bit over, if that's okay with you. Yeah, Juan? yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Juan, thanks for taking my question. I think uh, I'm a huge fan, and so it's uh, great to have this opportunity. Um, I read about how you and Kevin and Derek would were thinking about the music at the time you were making it and how you thought of it as being music for the future in some ways. Can uh -huh. you speak about those philosophies and how you were, you know, what was going through your mind when you were making it, you know, originally? Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever, ever been to Detroit, but uh, Detroit is kind of, it's a pretty desolate <laughs> city. I mean, it's kind of really post-industrial. So it's like it's a lot of crumbling and decay buildings. It's like you wouldn't believe it until you actually saw it. Um, and, and so you have this, this mindset where, you know, you want to try to get away. I mean, it's a great place. I love this city. That's why I'm still there, you know, on one hand. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, it, they, they never kind of rebuilt. It's like, it's like ruins, you know, and, and, and Sometimes in the back of your mind, you say, well, you know, I wish I could escape, but you can escape without actually leaving, you know? And I think that that was the mindset behind uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we were doing. It's, it's just, you know, when, you know, and that's probably why a lot of uh, the music and a lot of good music comes out of Detroit, because we don't really, it's not like uh, any other major city in America, especially like New York or LA. It's like we don't really have nothing, so, but music, you know, and, and so, you know, it's always a, a way to like maybe talk about escape, you know, traveling through time and space and going somewhere else, you know. Another question over there? Hey, Juan, yeah. Great, great for you to be here, thanks. Um, yeah, speaking on Detroit, given the current state, there is so much opportunity there as well, specifically with a lot of what we're talking about, technology and music. I'm just interested, you know, what, what's coming out of Detroit now, whether it is the music, whether there is just more opportunity that has you interested? Yeah. Um, well, you know, one good thing about Detroit is everything is cheap. So, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, you, you know, it's, it's not like in the other places, you know. Um, so uh, you can probably do, you have more money to do 
more things because you're not spending, you know, uh, $5 for a carton of milk, you know. It's a value investment. <laughs> yeah. You know, so basically, yeah, to sum it up. Does Detroit understand the like the ambassador they have in you? Like, does the, do they reach? Because there's a lot of efforts right now to revitalize Detroit. Yeah, you know, they're focusing on you know uh, economic recovery and focusing on business development and things like that. But music obviously has such a incredible history in Detroit between Motown and techno and you know so, some forms of rock. I mean, it's just there's so much that happened there. Yeah, do they, do, like, is are there formal Detroit officials in touch with you? About? Not, not, no. They might want to think. Of, I'll send another email about that. Later. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't they haven't embraced it like I think they should. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, slowly, you know, they come around and every every now and then they'll pop their head up and do something or make some kind of like, like they did. a uh, We did a, a, an exhibit at the uh, Detroit Hus Historical Museum uh, about five years ago. OK. And, you know, it was, you know, a lot of the mayor showed up and the mayor at the time. And uh, took had a photo out with us and yeah. things like it that. It seems like so. things are slowly, maybe. I mean, Detroit yeah. still has a long way to go, but it seems yeah. like things might be slowly, maybe, starting to creep it's, in the right direction. It's, yeah, and there's it, a lot of young artists that are moving there because there's affordable, very, very yeah. affordable homes, and yeah. it's kind of become a little bit of a hipster thing to do yeah. To, yeah. to take up and uh, go to Detroit. Yeah, it's 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 coming uh, coming along right now, especially lately. I think music could play such a big role with that. Yeah. Do we have a? Is there another question? It's hard to see because the lights up here. We good? All right, well, listen, um, I just want to remind people tonight, um, it, Juan is actually playing a DJ set. Uh, my complete inability to speak French does yeah. not allow me to pronounce the club name properly, but it's, uh, it looks like Les Marches, essentially. It's uh, M-A-R-C-H-E-S. <laughs> I know like French people are laughing at me. Um, uh, so I know that's where I'll be uh, later tonight, having a very good time. And um, Juan Atkins, I'm glad you're healthy and well, and uh, here's you. to many, many more years. Thank you so much okay. for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right.